so this evening we're looking at the church militant um our study for this evening would be the church militant and again this is important um as we understand that the church militant is a church that is ever moving forward is ever um changing and that the as the generation move on the lord always have himself a witness to preach the word um in season in the time that we're living um, so to quickly summarize, what is the church militant? What is the church militant? Um, the message of salvation never dies throughout the many centuries because God always raised up um, new groups or individuals to carry the light. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, we read, And from the days of jo John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffer vo violence, and vi the, violent, the violent take it by force. So the kingdom of heaven suffer violent violence and the violent take it by force, and um, <clears throat> this is 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 the 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 story of the Bible. This is the story of the Bible, as you know and you understand that the story of the Bible is 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 a simpler story that you know always show for that there is always conflict, not only conflict in the general world, but conflict within even the church. And we're told that we're supposed to contend for the faith. And so it is in that aspect that the church is militant. God always raised up from among the people, men and women um, of his chosen, in whom he had prepared um, and fitted to carry his gospel to the people. So again, there's a few things on the board there just to try to put in some key points um, before I go forward and lay out the Bible study. That I think is important for us to you know, contemplate that um, the, 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 the history of the Bible, many people say, well, the Old Testament is filled with a lot of um, gory stuff, a lot of blood and death and so forth. And the New Testament is not like that because we serve Jesus. And yet they say this while they behold Christ being slaughtered by the, the Pharisees. And then they behold so many of Christ's disciples dying at the, at, at the cross or dying in various different ways. And so all of this is there and so so forth and yet they say well it's different in the new testament and um and they see that says the gospel had to many times preach at the risk of those who preach it but somehow they say it's different something has changed well nothing has changed and as we know bloodshed never ceases and god's people continue to be suffer suffering persecution in river in various parts in this world that they live and although the persecution might be different in various different aspects, but in essence, the persecution and the trouble is always there. And so God's truth has to always go forward on the um, duress, so to speak, on the rough setting. Now, what methods are used to dim the light of God's church? So that's important when we're looking at the church militant. Because, in other words, what are we fighting against? What are we working against? What is What are we up against when we say, well, we are part of this church militant uh what are we dealing with in Matthew chapter 15 verse 1 to 9 we have the story here and then came jesus um then came to jesus scribes and pharisees which were of jerusalem saying why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders for they wash not their hand when they eat bread but he answered and said unto them why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your traditions? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that cursed father or mother, let him die the death. But ye, ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor it not father or, or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draw it nigh unto me with their mouth, and honor it me with their lips, but their hearts is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. And so this is one of always this is one of the things that's always going to be a major problems in the church. Christ faced it in his day, we will face it in our day, and we do face it in our day. And that is that we are up against the traditions of men. 
and the commandments are put aside, the word of God are put aside, and to do things according to whatever the society, the secular society is doing, or whatever is being done in the general community at large, even the Christian community. And so that's one thing that makes a church have to be militant. Because again, tradition will creep in and becomes a thus says the Lord when there's no Bible for it. And we see this a lot in the Christian community where people say they go, they follow according to the Bible or they say they follow according to the spirit of prophecy. And there's no, no, no thus says the Lord in there, no inspiration for that. And so that's one thing, why the church has to be militant. Because and God's people have to be militant. Now in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1 through 5. Um, we find here this concept here of a universal apostasy. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not that ye be not so sh soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a f there um, come sorry a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, whom opposed and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was um, yet with you, I told you these things. So we see this and we have seen this. And what is the reason why we have to be militant? Um, Sometimes calling, calling false leaders and false preachers what they are. is because, you know, there's always this constant rising up of people telling us that, you know, the crisis is about to come, you know, so give us all your money. Uh, you know, send us all the donations you can, Christ is about to come. And um, it could come within the next um, 30 days or before the next presidential election or, or all the amount of craziness. And this causes us to have to rise up in militancy because what it does is destroy the work of God and the preaching of the gospel. Because people are looking to not do the work of the Lord, not preach the gospel, but to be prepared for some night coming of the Lord. When it's not like we're trying to put the Lord, the coming of the Lord afar off, but it's not as all they would make it seem. You know, for the last so many years... I've heard so many people say that the Lord is going to come by the end of the year. And we're in 2012, and we're looking to end out or close out 2012. And so we see this, and so this causes us to have to, like, rise up and, you know, call, you know, call a spade a spade, as they say, or call the devil the devil. And oftentimes that make us seem a little bit militant, that make us seem a little bit, you know, like we're sometimes a little bit on the rough side of things. But it's just that we have to call out some some evil doers as they are. Now in John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 19. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 19. And again, important text. Um, this text here is now universally a problem that we're seeing, where it seems like people are turning to Satan, so to speak. Um, via the world. Now in 1 John chapter 2 verse 15 through 19 it reads, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the, the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Little children, is it in the, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that the Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they are not of us, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all, all of us. Now, I think those two texts, I read them together because I think it's important because, you know, one could take a transition from 18 and 19 and separate it out um, from verse 15. But I think oftentimes when it comes on to the Antichrist that's amongst us, there's many amongst us. 
and you, most of the time you can go, go on YouTube or on, on the TV and see them. They all they fill on the TV, you know, with the, these prosperity gospel preachers. Is technically I tell I see it as it's fulfilled, especially the prosperity gospel preacher. That these preachers really they are Christ because they 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 everything that they do and say is totally opposite to Christ. You know, they 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 these are people who love the world. As of verse 15, 16, and 17 says, they love the things of the world and they love the things that are passing away. And they lead people to believe in not the gospel and not the Christ that died for us, who lived a simple life, but they believe in Satan. That says you must live like Satan and be, live large and live proud and so forth. And so because of that, that again is another reason why it causes the church to have to be militant. Because again, if you're called to not love the world, you're called to live a simple life. You know, most people look at you as militant. Just these three things, I've, uh, four things I've covered already. You know, rejecting tradition of man. Rejecting the new universal apostasy and the man of sin. Rejecting the, the, the this false concept that Christ is about to come tomorrow. Um, rejecting worldliness. Because to love Christ, you know, to love Christ is to reject the world, is to take up your cross and follow Jesus. That makes one militant, and that's why the church is militant. Not because the whole general church is militant, but because when we accept these things, when God raises us up, when God calls us, when God fit us, He's fit us with these type of traits, so to speak. And when He fits us with these type of traits, you know, the people look at us and say, You're militant. You know, you seem very, you know, reform like you're reform minded. You seem very straight laced and you seem like you don't partake in certain things. But that's the reality. And that when you start to have one or two or three or four people that start acting like this, what you have is that you have this build up and that build up creates what I believe is a church method. So we, we keep looking at it here. Revelation chapter three. Revelation chapter three. This is another problem that's gonna have come in the last days. All right, and this I believe happens because of um, you know conformity to the world. Revelation chapter three, and if we read verse fourteen down, it says, "And unto the church, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write these things: say the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that I would thou wert cold or hot." So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increasing in goods, and I have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Again, fitly sum up those people that have been summing up in the first few verses. Worldly, love Satan. Love um, involved in the universal apostasy, involved in the tradition of men. If you look at all of this, this creates spiritual ap ap apathy. You, you, if you're interested in the more video games and cars and house and land and boat and gadgets, you know, you come to church, church is boring. You're interested in that. Somebody's coming to church to tell you that you must give up the word and follow Jesus. Man, you fall asleep. But those now who are like, yes, we need to follow Jesus. Yes, we need to have some spiritual zeal. People look at them and say they're militant. People look at them and say they, 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 they have too much zeal. They're fanatical. you seen this? Hey, man, I've seen it. Anyhow, I'm over here by myself. Okay, so Ephesians chapter um, 4. Look, look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 4. All right, spiritual apathy is the problem. So Ephesians chapter 4, the only thing that's created in this is disunity. And disunity comes because of what we're going to read in a few seconds here. Verse 1, 2, and 3 says, I therefore, the prison of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit, in the bond of peace. So notice the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Now we go down a little bit to verse 11 through 14 and look at what happened. This is another thing that's creating this because again, you know, conformity is substituted for true unity, but unity in the spirit and the faith will create that church militant. And that is the church militant, you know, not, not conformity to evil and evil doers. So that a billion people belong to a church it doesn't mean that they're right. It just means that there's a lot of people they can't find to conform 
to their traditions and their lies and their serving of Satan in, in the form of the, the Catholic priest or the Pope or whatever. Now look at it, verse 11 through 14, and it says here, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints and for the, the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Remember, this concept of the fullness of Christ has been rejected by the mainline church because they're saying you can't come to the measure of the fullness of Christ because you're going to be sinning until Jesus Christ come. And verse 13 says, Still we all come to the unity of the faith and measure. Verse 14, that we end for it, be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine and by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Notice all of that, all of that is building. This is what destroyed the church, dim the light in the church. When these things are rejected, the light in the church comes on. So if you wanted sometimes turn the light on in the church, you can't turn the light on in the church unless you turn off the things that are dimming the light in the church. And then you have a church that is militant. Without this, the church is not militant. Now it takes here that I think that is used to dim light in the church. It says in Revelation chapter 14, verse 4 and 5, or verse 4, verse 5, yeah, verse 4 and 5. And it says here, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a, a golden cup in her hand full of the abomination and the filthiness of her fornication. Again, when the church start to have these illicit relationships, and start to have in their hand, start to hold in their hand things that are of Satan and to acknowledge it as normal, then what you're having is now the church light is being dimmed. So in order for the church light to turn back on, in order for the church to be militant, in order for the light of Christ to shine from the church, what will have to happen is the false doctrines has to be put away. The evil doing has to be put away. The worldliness has to be put away. Notice it says that so this church, verse 5, and upon her forehead was written the name Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of Arles, the abomination of the earth. So we see here that it says, if the church started taking on all the abomination that is in the secular world, in the world, so to speak, then we have a problem. That's another thing that dims the light. So when the church started getting involved in spiritualism, speaking in tongues, prosperity, all that type of stuff, then what you find in the light of the church is dim. Because I'm telling you, there's not like a person who would, you know, kill a person for money. And, and you know, the people, some of the people who do that the most is that these doctors operate on people and cut them up when they don't need to. Refuse to tell them to eat LT, all that type of stuff, so that they can drive the expensive cars and stuff like that. And this is what the church do. Instead of telling people the truth, they prefer to just take the people money and send them to hell. He says, and I saw the woman drunk here with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus Christ. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And so we see here that the church that is filled with abomination, filled with spiritualism, which is mystery, filled with false doctrine, filled with um, persecuting the righteous, the light of that church has been dim. And this is what we see throughout the generation. Every true church gets their light dim in this method. What is the history of God's faithful people? Now we're going to look at what's the history. Just to correlate this idea that this has always been what's happened. Satan used all these methods to dim the truth in, of God's church so that he cannot shine out. Now in Hebrews 11 verse 23 through 38, we read a quick synopsis of our quick history of God's church and how Satan will work to dim the light and how God will work to Make the light shine in that church. Now Hebrews 11 verse 28 through 38, 23 through 38, we read, By faith, when he was born, was hid three months in um, by of his parents, because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he had come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy pleasures the pleasures of sin for a season esteeming the reproach of christ greater riches than the treasures in egypt for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward all right by faith he forsook egypt not fearing the wrath of the king 
for he endured as seen him who is invisible. All right. Now, before I go any further, as you know, the story today, they will say he's a fanatic. Biblically, this is a very zealous person that believes in the Lord and chose not to go with prosperity gospel, choose to go with a simple life, choose to be like Christ in as much as possible that he could have been in order to live a successful Christian life. This is what is gone from the church. And notice it's through him that the church could be militant, the church could shine, and the church could enter on a conflict and succeed because who is at the helm, who is leading, understand what it is to sacrifice all, to give up all for the gospel's sake, for the light's sake. Not easily done. But here we continue. Verse 28. True faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he, lest he that um, be dis that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea and by an, as by dry land which the Egyptians as say to do were drawn because they ain't doing it by faith. By faith, the wall of Jericho fell down after they were a compass about seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and the prophets. Notice, all of these men, all of these women, they took the, the kingdom of God by force. They understood that says, to win the battle of this life, it had to be by severe trial, by pressing forward. It couldn't be by just like says, you know, going down the street and everything is like a park, everything is beautiful, everything is nice and quiet. They had to take it by force. And you notice they run into trouble when they relaxed their energies. But when they press the battle, that's when success was given them. And this is what's called a church militant. The church never ceases its warfare. Notice the moment John and Paul and John put in prison, Paul died and so forth. The church floundered and lost its way because the leaders come up. They just want to have things so nice and easy. They don't want to have beautiful worship service and everything is so nice and beautiful. And they don't want to press the battle, both in their personal life and in the church. We continue after David. Look again, men that... um and women that stood for something. All right, so sorry here. I'm just trying to, this is where, um, and it says here, by faith, the wall of Jericho fell down, by faith, the heart of Rhea, and then it says here, and 33, I'll go straight to 33, and it says, and through faith, subdue um, kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtain promise, says, stop the mount of lions, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, wax valiant in flight, turn the flight of armies of the aliens, women received their dead race to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting the deliverance, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others have trial of cruel mocking and scourging, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, were slain with a the sword. They wandered about in sheepskin and goatskin, being destitute and afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Quick summary of the history of the church. That's the history of God's church. That's the history of the church militant. And so people want to belong to the church, but they want to belong to something that's mamby pamby, as they say. That's just like, you know, roller pole day brings just something that's just going along and chugging along and just falling over to every sin, falling over to every temptation, not trying to combat, not trying to roll back evil. And they look at it and say, well, that's okay, because that's it's God's true church. Now, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 through 17, again, taking another synopsis of the church militant and it says here and i heard a loud voice saying in heaven now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our god and the power of his christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our god day 
and night. Notice Christ died. He went to heaven. He won the battle upon the cross. And that gave him power to kick out Christ. You see, I mean, kick out Satan. Now, if you look at that, that's very important because, again, these are spiritual battles that mean something, that have an effect. These are overcoming battles that have an effect. And this is what we're into. We're into what we call the great controversy, the plan of salvation. It is the redemption of man, but it doesn't come at an easy price. Neither for us, even, even though we accept Christ as a free gift, but it still comes at a cost because we still have to give up the world. We still have to accept Christ. We still have to, you know, I, I, years ago, I, rem I realized that in order for me to be saved, I have to overcome the members in the church. Years ago, I realized this. You know, I was in church and I realized, you know, I, I can't be saved. I don't overcome these members because they will try to lead you to and tempt you and lead you into fornication and lead you into adultery and lead you into a prosperity type lifestyle and running down goods. They will try to deceive you with false doctrine. They will try to deceive you with false pastors and false prophets and you name it. And you think, oh man, these are God's and they'll lead you to hell. All right, and then uh, you realize that's it, that battle has to be fought because guess what happened? If you lose that battle to temptation by others, you lose the battle. If you make people lead you down the primrose part of sin and evil, you will lose that battle. You find yourself out there sinning like anything, listening to secular music, living like the pagan, eating like the pagan. And next thing you know, you realize, wait a minute, who gave me this food? Who told me to dress like this? The same members in the church influence you to the wrong way. So you have to stand strong. That's where I'm going. All right. Should have gone there already. Verse 11 says here, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the dead. All right. Because if you love your life unto the dead, you will lose it. Therefore rejoice ye heaven and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he know it that he had but a short time, 2,000 years at this point. And all his energy now is going to be directed only earthwise, because again, he's not going back and forth. And when the dragon saw that he was cast onto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child, and we know that went on into the, through the dark ages. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a times for, from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out his mouth, water as a flood, you know, water represent in, in prophecy much people, uh, flood after the woman that they might cause her to be carried away um, of the flood. All right. And I'm telling you something. And why it's a prosperity amass believers, but um, adversities wipe them out or remove them. I tell you, they're not like trouble. If everything is going good, people join your church. You have 10,000 people, 20,000 people in your church, 5,000, 40 something thousand people because the prosperity gospel is being preached. But tell them to pick up their cross, make some trouble happen. And you see your church empty out fast. Okay. And verse 16 says, and the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And so she was helped. And she ultimately, we know this is, she ended up finding the new world. And she came over here in the new world and be able to have peace and quiet in the mountains, worshiping God according to the dictates of her conscience. And the dragon was wrath with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God. And now the testimony of Jesus. And most naturally, we believe that says this is the end time church. That the end time church is centralized in the location where we call earth. None other than, none other than the United States of America. Verse, um, verse 7 of Revelation chapter 13, we read in verse 7 and 8. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And the power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nation all king Jed, tongue and nation which is very important because then you say well where her influences does not extend and we know it's everywhere they said there's even jesuits in monasteries in china and different places and in hindu hindu worship ceremonies and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose name are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world yes even those people in India that's getting out in the spirit, they're worshiping him because he's the one that orchestrates all that 
evil because he's the mother of all of it. What does the Bible teach about God's remnant at the end of time? Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and we're reading this time verse 25 through um, 25 through um, 27. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 27 says, What does the Bible teach about God's remnant at the end of time? 25 through 27. Husband loves your wives even as the Christ loves loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, and, and, the, and the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot, a wrinkle, or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. So we know at the end of time that God's going to have a church without spot or without wrinkle. God's going to have a church that is a righteous church. That's not going to happen because God's people just sit there waiting for the Holy Spirit to descend. They're going to press the battle. They're going to overcome sin. They're going to be looked upon as straight lace, as peculiar, as a church that is militant, as a church that is righteous. That's the only way. You can't be like the world. You can't be like the world and fulfill this, this prophecy here. Can't be. It's impossible. You can't be like want to worry about what the Baptists and the Methodists and all of one safe, always safe churches do and, you know, and fulfill this because you're going to have to look upon as straight lace. You have to be looked upon as a primitive church that was willing to suffer persecution at the hand of evil doors. Revelation chapter 12 verse 17 says, And the dragon was wrath again with the woman to went make war with remnant of her seed that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Here again, in repeat, the church is described here as keep the commandments of God and have the testimony in their position, in their possession, the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's a righteous church. And if you have the testimony, you have it. And so that's important. That's what we're told. And let no one tell you, oh, no, you know, the church is just going to sin until Jesus come. And then we're going to just, all of a sudden, it's going to be national sin law. People are going to get shake out and we're all going to get it right. And no. So wait a minute. Are we supposed to live righteous today? Whether or not Christ come today, we're supposed to live righteous today. Why are we waiting for some future hope to live righteous? Because somebody told us that and there's no Bible text for it. Revelation chapter 14, verse 1 through 5. Again, the description of God's church in the last days. Okay. And it says here, And I look, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their forehead. And I heard a voice from heaven as the as the voice of many waters and as the voice of the great th thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their strings. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. No man could learn the song but the 144,000 which were the, the redeemed from the earth. These are they which are not defiled with women for they are virgins. They are, they, these are they which follow the Lamb wheresoever it goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruit unto God and unto the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they were without fault before the throne of God. This is not ceremonial. This is not legislative. This is character change. Character change has happened to these people. And in the last day, we believe there's going to be a generation that we will belong to that will go through and that we will not have any guile in our mouth that means that if we don't even speak a lie or speak the truth and make it sound like a lie or whatever you know what i'm saying we speak straight because we keep the commandment of we have the testimony of jesus christ i'm going to say oh you're commandment keeper yes but we have the testimony of jesus christ can't argue against that that's what the bible says and these are data follow them wherever we go we follow them here we don't follow prosperity gospel preaching we don't follow sin until Jesus Christ say to come. We follow the gospel. And so again, another clear description of what God is laying out that will happen for his people in the last days. Revelation chapter 7, verse 1 through 14. As we look here at the church militant. This is the church that's going through. Ain't you know, fake church. And going through Revelation chapter 7, verse 1 through 4. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor any tree. 
And I saw in another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now again, very important, very succinct text. If you look at this, it outlines what's going to happen in the last things, what's happening, I believe now, that God's children are being sealed. I believe it. What's happening is that it says we see that there is an issue of earthly destruction. You know, there's an issue that not just of war and famine and you know population and resources issue where there's so much resort you know, the lack of resources. But we see the ceiling issue also with that says there's issue with what's going on in the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom and natural disasters and so forth. But the Lord is saying to hold back until I seal. To prepare that 144,000 who has no guile in their mouths. Not have no guile, guile because they judicially have no guile. They have no guile because they don't speak a lie. And this is very important. So no guile in their mouth and their seal in their forehead. So we believe that that's where we're at. We believe that that's in front of us. That we're staring at that and we're looking at that. Because remember, it happens when the darkness is so dark in the church. It happens when we're told that the church almost seemed to almost fall because of the things coming in, like spiritualism, like false doctrine, like all these things. And if you look around and you see that there's a lot of wind of doctrines blowing, then we know we're getting there. Isaiah chapter 8. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 8. Um, Isaiah chapter 8, very important again, because I think this spells out some things for us when it comes on to the characteristics of that church and again we're going to study that again next week we'll look at that a little bit more because there's a lot of false teachers out there and christian i'm telling us that the church is the, the church is going to be raptured out of here and not only study rapture per se next week but i'm just saying it's teaching that this church, the church is going to be raptured out and that israel is god's true church and they're so confused I, anyhow, so verse 16, um, verse 9, sorry, verse Isaiah chapter 8, verse 9 to 16. Associate yourself, O ye people, and ye shall be broken in pieces, and give ear, O ye of, far, of, of a far country. Gird yourself, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourself, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Verse 10 says, Take counsel of it together, and it shall come to naught. <laughs> Speak the word, and it shall not stand, for God is for God is with us. For the Lord, for the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand, and instruct me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy? To all them that whom this people shall say, a confederacy, neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. Now, this is important, as you know, because we know that part of the problem in the last days is with the unions, with the secret society like the knights of the columbus and the lodges and the um freemasons and all that type of stuff that they'll do confederate work and their thing is that they 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 trust in arm the, you know the the, the the abram tanks and the missiles so much that the bible says that we cannot fear their fear we're gonna have to put our trust in god because God is saying that they will confederate together. We see this. They'll confederate to take over nations. But God says we must not fear their fear. Because we believe in the mighty arm of God. And that God will deliver us. And so he said don't fear the fear of the people. Neither should we teach the fear of the people. And sometimes people are teaching with the hope that they want to expose these groups. 
but somehow never clarified to the fullest that these groups, not only are they dying as we speak by the diseases that they're eating, but these groups are being destroyed by the Lord. They will not confederate and succeed because God will destroy them one by one. And we've been seeing that. Not only are they killing each other, and they kill, they're being killed by their own folly. So we continue, and we'll deal with that more in the next couple of weeks. Verse 14 says, And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to both the house of Israel, for a gin and for a snare for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Again, don't fear what they fear. The prophets never fear what they fear. The prophets were always, you look at the story with Jeremiah. They were taken in captivity, but the righteous was always blessed. Look at Daniel. The righteous was always blessed. Ezekiel, so forth. The righteous was always blessed and protected by God. We don't fear their fear because we have a God that is above all kings. We serve God. Very important. And so that's the God's church in the last days. You ain't fearing no man. And your verse 15 says, And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be sneered and be taken. This is going back to what I'm talking about in the last days. It's a church militant. Bind up the testimony and seal the law among my disciples. This is what we're all about here. Verse 19. And when they shall say unto you, see unto them that have familiar spirits and unto wizards that peep and that mutter. Should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? So it asks a question. And it's a very important question as we know it in these last days because we know what's going on. These people, where they're, 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 they're going to spiritualists, they're going to spiritual mediums, and they're seeking um, clarification. What's happening? You know, We know that many of the Wall Street investors, they go to psychics and they go to di different places to find out how to invest because everything seems so volatile. People are buying gold and people are buying silver. We're told that they're going to throw the gold and the silver in the street because they don't know what to do. And this is what's going to happen. And so the Bible says, because of their fear, they will open themselves up to what? Spiritual mediums. They will open themselves up to witchcraft and sorcery and so forth. And this is what's going on last day. And God's church will not do that. While mystery the Babylon is coming in, I mean, God's true church, I would say, the militant church. While mystery Babylon is coming in, and we see even in our ranks the constant rancor about um, spiritualism and spiritual formation, we will not go to those things because we're going to seek God. Verse 20. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And this text has become so much more important in these last days we're living. Because this text is telling us that we never go to the dark side to find truth. Not like what Saul did. You can only find truth in the word of God and through meditation and prayer on that word. Anything else outside of that word, anything else outside of praying to the Most High God is sorcery and witchcraft and is going to demons working through the guise of men. Pause, pause with them. We see this coming in and we see this major in the society. We see so much sorcery going on in our society with so many new businesses of um, psychics that are opening up all over the place. And it tells us that says we're wrapping up. We're wrapping up. Continue going just to close off here. Second Timothy chapter um, um yeah, yeah, that's cut and paste cause that. It says, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that name it the name of Christ depart from what? Iniquity. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And if we believe in God, if we are God, we have to depart from iniquity. We can't listen to these people. The law and the testimony have to be bound up against us. Anybody that tells us any otherwise is working for Satan. They're working to make us worldly. They're working to make us sinners. And we have to reject that. No doubt. If we accept this, we're going to help. This, this is just straight what's going on. The foundation stand for sure. The word of the God is sure. Revelation and Daniel is sure. There's no question about it. And as we see spiritualism increase, as we see lawlessness increase, we have to know that we, we have to depart from evil 
if we love the Lord and we stick with the Lord. And I'll try to find it in a second. Or somebody's typing. Thanks. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. Thanks very much. Um, and it says, oh man, Tofu. Amen, Bible students. So it says here, John chapter 3, verse 33 and 34. And, and then we go down to 36. It says here, He that had received his testimony had set his seal, his seal that God is what? Is true. Now, this is talking about John the Baptist. And he that accept his testimony, I've accepted the seal that God is true. And we believe in the testimony that John preached that Christ was the Son of God. And we believe in Christ's testimony. For he whom God has sent speak the word of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believe on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abided on him. And that's what's going on. If you see some of these people with their troubles and their trials, it's because they do not abide with Christ and everlasting life is not in them. And they do not have the seal of God set upon them. And this is where we're going in the last days. We're going to accept God's seal, to accept God's word for the last day. And so we believe that the church militant will be sealed. We believe that they composed the 144,000. We believe that says when a shaking, which is happening now, when people are being shaken out, we know shaken out in a few ways. They're shaken out in doctrine. They're shaken out in faith. Because some that person could believe all the right doctrine, but their faith gets shaken. I remember the story this lady told me that she read one time in a book. Very sad story that a lady was faithful for many years. And at the end of her life, she received, she had cancer. And when she was in the room, in the hospital room, um, you know, believing in the health message all these years, being on the hospital bed with cancer. When they came around to order the food, she said, just give me some bacon and egg. All right? You know, you can't go out like that. You better die of cancer and go to heaven. Amen? But you can't just live faithful all your life and then you're going to give up. Are you going to give in to appetite? You're going to give in like that? We have to hold on, hold fast to our faith. We got to hold fast to the Ten Commandments. We got to hold fast to the true word of God. We got to, if, if the word of, if, if it's not to the law and to the testimony, and it's contradicting law and testimony, we got to reject that. And we can't, can't go down the primus part with people because they're telling us to come and come to the party and come to the social gathering and, you know, be like us and drink like us and eat like us and dress like us and make up like us. None of that. This is why it's destroying the church and making the church not militant and making the church not preaching any words. So I pray that God may bless you and we just close with a prayer. Thank you, Lord, again for your mercies that have found us and have made us your children. And that you have sealed us, dear Lord, into thy truth, that we might be settled into the truth, that we cannot be moved, that evil shall be evil, and that righteousness shall always be righteousness, and that we shall put a difference, dear Lord, between the holy and the profane. May you bless each and every one of us here, and may you give us thy spirit, that we can have the power, dear Lord, not only to live righteous, but to preach the word with zeal, and to care for your message to a dying world. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you again, everyone. And thanks again for um, spending time. Yes.